Hello everyone, my name is Bob Akrahimi. I'm a faculty member here at the Program for the Study of Religion, also Department of Literature at UCSD. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to the Forum on Religion. The Forum is designed so we could invite a leading scholar to come and engage on campus, to engage with faculty, uh, uh, campus faculty members, and discuss uh, key issues that relate to religion and society. Uh, and, and really the idea is to rethink religion uh, and how it impacts uh, American, contemporary American life and also connect it to a broader global processes. So there's a lot to talk about tonight, there's a lot to discuss. I won't take too much of your time, but I'd like to, uh, before I introduce our guest speaker and our campus um, faculty uh, uh, speakers as well, let me just say uh, I'd like to thank Tanya Myers for working very hard. Where's Tanya? Tanya Myers for working very hard in, in organizing and putting, putting this event together. I also like to thank my uh, colleagues in the program for the study of religion, Professor Dana Claris. Uh, Dana, where are you? For, for her support, and also Professor Richard Cohen for his support in having an event like this. It's a fantastic event in which allows UCSD to encounter a leading scholar. But before I introduce our leading uh, scholar, let me just briefly um, tell you what the forum, how the forum is actually organized. The structure is that the speaker uh, guest will give her talk, and after that, we'll have around 20, 30 minutes of discussion by UCSD faculty. And after that, uh, the, uh, you know, this place will be opened up to Q&A section. So you could actually ask any questions you have related to the topic. To introduce our UCSD faculty here, um, going by alphab alphabetical order, First is Roshanake Khesti. She is assistant professor of ethnic studies and affiliate faculty in critical gender studies program here at UCSD. She has published in the journals Feminist Studies, American Quarterly, Hypatia, and Parallax, and has forthcoming manuscript entitled Modernity's Ear. Uh, our uh, second um, um, UCSD faculty guest is Professor Richard Matson. He is a distinguished professor of sociology and the director of the UC Fudan Center at UCSD. Uh, professor Madison is known for his numerous books and articles and also uh, co-edited books. Uh, he's known for his uh, works in sociology of religion, American Chinese cultures, and international studies. I particularly um, um, have known pr uh, Professor Madison for his 1994 book that's called China, an American Dream. I used to read it here when I was undergrad, um, and of course his work is very well known in the field. Uh, and also, um, Professor uh, David Serlin, uh, he's also the chair of the Department of, of Communication and a professor in that department. Uh, his, uh, among his numerous publications, is uh, titled Replaceable You, Engineering the Body in Post-War America, which was published by Chicago Press in 2004. And he also won the 2005 Alan Bray Memorial Book Award uh, from the Modern Language Association. Uh, having said this, um, I think we're gonna have a very interesting discussion uh, in light of what uh, Professor uh, Diane Winston will talk about tonight. Uh, just to introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, Professor Diane Winston holds the night chair in media and religion at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. She's a national authority on religion and the media as both a journalist and a scholar. Her expertise include religion, politics, and news media, as well as religion and in entertainment media. Between 1983 and 1995, Professor Winston covered religion for uh, various different newspapers, including the Dallas Times Herald and Baltimore Sun, and contributed regularly to the Dallas Morning News. She has won numerous press association awards and been has been dom nominated for the uh, Pulitzer Prize. Her articles also have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Global Post, and the Chronicle, a Chronicle of Higher Education, among other publications. Among her numerous published books are Red Hot and Righteous, The Urban Religion of the Salvation Army. This book was published by Harvard Press in 1999. Faith in the Market, Religion and Urban Commercial Culture, uh, Culture by Rutgers in 2003. Small Screen Picture, Lived Religion and Television, which was published in 2009. And the Oxford Handbook on Religion and American News Media, which was published in 2012. 
Uh, I'd like to now invite Professor Winston to come to the, please, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to be out of Los Angeles even for a day, you know? It just gets uh, tiresome to be in one place all the time behind your computer, typing, typing, typing. I'm sure some of you know the feeling. So on Thursday, November 7th, 1991, Irvin Magic Johnson stunned fans with the news he was retiring from basketball. Just days before, during a routine blood test, the Lakers superstar discovered he'd contracted the AIDS virus. The newlywed but legendary ladies' man seemed as surprised as everyone else that a disease once thought to plague only Haitians, homosexuals, and hemophiliacs had struck him. It can happen to anybody, even me, Johnson said in words that the New York Times selected as the quote of the day. That day, the Times featured several stories on Johnson's revelation. There was a requisite page one article, but the paper also ran reaction pieces, analyses, and a health story that looked at the spread of AIDS among heterosexuals. That Johnson, a heterosexual athlete, could have the disease both upended and corroborated the tropes that had defined the crisis and its coverage. Reporting on AIDS in the decade before Johnson's revelation had been bound up with issues of sexuality. And by 1983, a medical moral frame rendered religion integral to the mix. Journalists echoing conservatives' claims that AIDS was divine punishment for illicit behavior turned coverage into another arena for the culture war. However, as the decade progressed, alternate religious narratives arose, specifically AIDS as a spiritual trial and a pastoral challenge. Johnson's announcement brought together all three, his premarital promiscuity, his shattered career, and his return to church. Yet his stature as a sports hero and his identification as a secular public figure eclipsed the religious subtexts of his story and helped shift future coverage away from religious tropes. In the time we have together, I'd like to explore how, when, and why the news media, specifically the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Dallas Morning News, deployed religion in its early AIDS coverage. To do that, I need to go back a bit and look at reporting on homosexuality in the pre-AIDS era. Then after describing AIDS coverage, I will close with some reflections on how reporting from 30 years ago still reverberates today. In 1981, before Johnson's announcement, the New York Times printed its first story on AIDS, a brief about an unusual cancer occurring among homosexual men. Over the subsequent decade, the Times, reflecting the quandary of newsrooms nationwide, grappled with reporting on the mysterious outbreak. AIDS exposed social and cultural fault lines that made coverage more than just a medical story. Its initial outbreak in the homosexual community made AIDS a story about sexuality and religion, too. In 1981, the majority of American Christians, including Roman Catholics, Evangelicals, Mormons, and some mainline Protestants, believe that the Bible condemned and forbade, forbade homosexual behavior. Some conservative Christians, learning from their liberal co-religionists engaged in the civil rights movement, had already organized political campaigns in support of their religious beliefs, such as efforts to stop the ERA and abortion, legalized abortion. A progression of Supreme Court decisions from the banning of school prayer and Bible reading in the early 60s to the sanctioning of birth control and abortion gave rise to an unprecedented coalition of Protestant evangelicals, Roman Catholics, Orthodox Jews, and Mormons who believed that the evacuation of religion from American public life and the sexual revolution threatened the well-being of traditional families, the backbone of American society, and by extension, God's blessing on his chosen nation. 
By the early 1980s, reporters were borrowing the conservatives' religious frame for stories on contentious social issues. According to popular televangelists such as Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, feminists, abortionists, and homosexuals flouted biblical teaching and provoked divine wrath. Culture war stories had color, conflict, and outrageous quotes from fundamentalists who saw God's hand in everything from earthquakes to elections. While some readers were familiar with these beliefs, others were un unaware of such sentiments until journalists mainstreamed them. Falwell and Robertson were eminently quotable, and their national followings gave them legitimacy. Falwell headed the Moral Majority, a political advocacy group that worked across religious lines, and his old-time Gospel Hour had millions of viewers. Robertson, who had run for president in 1988, had funded the Christian Broadcasting Network and hosted its flagship news and talk program, The 700 Club. AIDS appeared against this backdrop at the moment when coverage, much less balanced coverage, of homosexuality was still fairly new. According to author Edward Alwood, quote, until World War II, homosexuals were unmentionable in American newspapers and magazines, except in tabloids and the African-American press, which mockingly covered drag balls. The 1948 publication of Albert, Alfred Kinney's Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, reporting that male-on-male -male sexual encounters were more common than previously imagined, could have signaled a change. But another 15 years passed before most newspapers took note of an increasingly visible gay community, and another 30 years elapsed before reporting was routine. That shift was due, in part, to a story that the mainstream media initially missed. Gays and lesbians began forming advocacy and support groups in the 1950s. Among their initial concerns was mainstream news coverage, which was routinely negative. Despite appeals for balanced and accurate reporting, gays were routinely depicted as perverts whose deviant behavior made them suspect as neighbors, employees, and citizens. In 1963, when the Times, New York Times ran a front page story on the growing presence of homosexuals in the city, its tone was hostile. According to the reporter, an increasingly large and open homosexual population, quote, has become the subject of growing concern of psychiatrists, religious leaders, and the police. As the decade passed, homosexual groups, following the example of civil rights activists, organized protests against discriminatory employment practices, police entrapment, and raids on gay clubs and bars. The press paid scant attention. The now iconic Stonewall Raid, the June 1969 clash between police and gays in New York's Greenwich Village, was barely noted in the mainstream media. The New York Times piece ran on page 33, and the Daily News story ran on page 30. Coverage increased in the 1970s as gays and lesbians, like members of other liberation groups, marched and lobbied. Gays also challenged psychiatrists whose categorization of their behavior as deviant was a media staple. In 1973, when the American Psychiatric Association withdrew its classification of homosexuality as mental illness, the change was widely reported. Gay activists won other battles, too. A growing number of cities added sexual orientation to anti-discrimination laws, and an increasing number of public figures, including authors, athletes, and politicians, came out openly acknowledging their sexuality. By the end of the decade, many reporters, encouraged to write about this new constituency, profiled a community with its own bars, clubs, music, and fashion, as well as an uninhibited sexual scene. Coverage, by the way, was much more weighted toward gay men than to lesbians who were almost invisible in the mainstream media. Journalists also covered an emerging backlash, religious backlash against gay rights, coalescing in the 1977 campaign to rescind a Dade County, Florida anti-discrimination ordinance. Entertainer Anita Bryant, crusading to save our children, rallied Christians to repeal the statute, which they did by an overwhelming majority. In stories such as the Florida repeal, opponents of homosexuality explicitly argued the ordinance was immoral and anti-family. 
whether in, in art, articles about gays open sexuality, narratives, implicit newspaper narratives, implicitly set us against them, inviting readers to puriently observe and judge gay behavior. Both types of coverage set gay sexuality over against monogamous heterosexual families. A mysterious cancer that initially afflicted gay men did not strike mainstream journalists as newsworthy. In 1981, when physician Lawrence Mass wrote about it for New York Native, a small gay newspaper, the disease did not even have a name. Several weeks later, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta reported an outbreak of a rare cancer among a handful of gay men in Los Angeles. Soon after, several news outlets, starting with the Los Angeles Times, reported the findings. Another month passed before the New York Times mentioned the unidentified disease, which by then had killed 41 homosexuals. Despite its rapid spread, the cancer did not receive thorough or ongoing coverage. Communication scholar Larry Gross has speculated that a mix of homophobia, disinterest, and squeamishness kept the press at bay. If a reporter came forward to cover the story, his editor would assume he was a homosexual, a liability in most newsrooms. Editors also assume that readers would not care about an illness that did not directly affect them. According to Allwood, reporters at the New York Times had an especially difficult time. Even though Iphigene Salzberger, the daughter of the newspaper's owner, the wife of its second publisher, and the mother of its current publisher, was removed from daily um, decision making, her wishes were, not surprisingly, followed. In a 1966 letter to her son, the publisher, Salzberger described homosexuality as a perversion, adding it should not be played on the front of a section. Moreover, many staffers considered Abe Rosenthal the Metropolitan Editor who oversaw the 1963 story on homosexuals growing visibility, and the Executive Editor when the AIDS crisis began to be homophobic. Thus, despite covering the city with the largest gay community in the US and the highest number of AIDS cases, the New York Times reportage, especially in the early years, was spotty. Dallas, on the other hand, despite its Sunbelt location and large evangelical population, provided a very different scenario. Exact statistics are hard to come by, but the metro area may have had the largest, if not the most visible, gay community in the South. The city was also home to the Cathedral of Hope, the country's largest gay church. Early on, editors at the Dallas Morning News decided to provide aggressive and comprehensive coverage of AIDS and by the late 1980s had a full-time reporter on the beat. Throughout the 80s, the morning news coverage looked at AIDS from multiple perspectives, including its impact on individuals, religious groups, and the public health system. It also ran national stories that put AIDS in a wider context. By the 1980s, the LA Times had shed its image as a parochial right-wing newspaper and had emerged as a journalistic force. East Coast newsrooms were captive to Beltway politics or Wall Street machinations, but journalists at the LA Times were encouraged to follow their instincts. The LA Times was the first mainstream newspaper to report on AIDS and the first to run a, first, a front page story on its spread. The medical reporter wrote the early pieces, but others found angles to follow up, and reporting intensified as the decade progressed. The paper's openness also reflected the city's large gay population and diverse religious landscape. Notwithstanding the paper's different approaches, AIDS was not a big story in the early 80s. Some outlets, including the San Francisco Papers, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Long Island Newsday, provided regular updates and features. But the reticence of the New York Times, the industry's standard bearer, provided cover for newsrooms that preferred to ignore the growing problem. According to author James Kinsella, much of the early AIDS reporting fell to the wire services, the Associated Press and United Press International, and it focused more on the hard news of the epidemic spread rather than on the crisis human dimension. By 1982, nearly 800 AIDS cases had been diagnosed. According to one study, children were increasingly infected, which suggested everyone was at risk. Although a threat to the general population was quickly dismissed, the implication was clear. No one was safe. Within the year, 
newspapers were writing not only about the medical and scientific aspects of the disease, but also of its social and cultural ramifications. According to religious conservatives, those were dire. Religious leaders theologized the epidemic, turning a, a medical problem into a moral issue. AIDS was not just a disease, it was the embodiment of sin. The Reverend Jerry Falwell crystallized the conservative position when he declared in July 1983 that AIDS was God's punishment against those, quote, who break the laws of nature and the laws of moral decency. A media savvy fundamentalist, Falwell's pithy condemnations of abortion and feminism had garnered headlines. Now reporters cited his, or as he would say, God's opinion on gay, gays and AIDS. In a series of speeches and media appearances that summer, Falwell stated that homosexuality was a sin and that AIDS was divine judgment against a nation that tolerated immorality. Visiting Washington, D.C., he urged the federal government to close gay bathhouses, to monitor gays donating blood, and to provide safety guidelines for professionals, including police doctors and morticians who worked with people with AIDS. The theme of divine judgment had surfaced before Falwell became, to, became the go-to guy connecting AIDS with God's wrath. In May 1983, a New York Times piece quoted the Reverend William Sloan Coffin, the minister of New York's historically liberal Riverside Church, who had been ministering to people with AIDS. Quote, some felt this was in some way God's punishment, he said. I reassured them that they have no right to feel in any way that this is God's will. Being gay is not a sin. It given societal attitudes towards homosexuals. A 1983 poll found 70% of respondents were unsympathetic to gays. Aid sufferers internalized shame and guilt was unsurprising. When Falwell gave voice to these sentiments, news outlets use the opportunity to quote a nationally known religious leader. Even opponents repeated Falwell's stance. It was a de facto conservative position. Throughout the mid 80s, reporters routinely cited the AIDS divine punishment position. If God's wrath went unmentioned, Falwell's other concerns, the homosexual threat to family, the need to proactively protect citizens from gays with AIDS were raised. These fears were reported to be among liberal Christians, too. According to a New York Times article, after one of the ministers at, Li at Riverside Church preached a sermon saying heterosexual marriage was biblically based and deviations were therefore sin, the congregation found itself more deeply divided than it had been on any issue since the Vietnam War. Several months later, the paper reported on churches that, quote, have had to struggle with fears over drinking from a common communion cup, even though clerics have said in sermons that there is no evidence that the disease can be transmitted that way. The article noted that ministers nationwide regretted that they had not done more to combat negative religious stereotypes about gays and AIDS. These clergy, typically mainline Protestant ministers, had been slow to develop a response to AIDS in fact, the epidemic pushed many to re-examine their theological positions on sexuality, though several years would pass before they could articulate them to the media. In July 1985, actor Rock Hudson gave AIDS its first celebrity face. Hudson's homosexual orientation had been rumored for years, but speculation became rampant when he appeared gaunt and listless. After he announced that he had AIDS, media coverage tripled. Papers that had relied on the wires started writing their own aid stories and, quote, reporting in print media increased by 270% between Hudson's diagnosis and the end of 1985. Hudson's admission also spurred a shift in public opinion confirmed by an LA Times poll. While 73% of respondents said homosexuality was wrong, the same percentage as in 1973, 41% said they were, quote, sympathetic to gays, a rise of 11% in two years. Still, 28% agreed that AIDS is God's punishment, and 23% concurred AIDS victims are getting what they deserve. 
A subsequent LA Times article, AIDS, Rigid Church View is Fading, reflected both negative and positive findings. Beginning with an anecdote about an evangelical church that refused to baptize an AIDS patient because members feared he would pollute the water, the article documented instances of religiously based prejudice. Yet midway through, the reporter noted, quote, religious voices are increasingly departing from the theme that AIDS is God's wrath on homosexuals. Both New York and LA papers were particularly attuned to Roman Catholic reaction since both cities had large Catholic populations. Coverage illuminated the church's desire to act compassionately to people with AIDS, but still to condemn homosexuality. Reporting on a new Vatican document that did not mention the disease, but denounced, quote, the pro-homosexual movement, the New York Times quoted an unnamed Vatican source who noted, quote, in 1986, AIDS cannot be ignored in any consideration of the moral and ethical issues raised by homosexuality. Reporters scrutinized the Pope's words and actions to reveal the Vatican position. The back and forth over whether or not John Paul II would visit an AIDS hospice during his 1987 visit to San Francisco was widely reported. He didn't visit. As were his attempts to confront the growing health crisis. Whenever Cardinal John O'Connor of New York or Archbishop Roger Mahoney of Los Angeles addressed the problem, their respective papers took notice. While the New York Times covered O'Connor's efforts to help people with AIDS, it also reported his strong denunciation of homosexuality and condom use. In 1989, ACT UP, an AIDS advocacy group, organized to stop the church demonstration at St. Patrick's Cathedral to draw attention to O'Connor's opposition to safe sex and abortion. More than 4,500 protesters tried to obstruct services. Even the Times stayed reportage could not mask the antic disruption. Quote, some of the protesters chained themselves to pews inside the cathedral, while others shouted or lay in the aisles. The following day, O'Connor told a reporter that mass would be interrupted, quote, only over my dead body. Several weeks later, a similar protest occurred in Los Angeles, but this time only 10 of the 50 activists present participated during Mahoney's sermon at midnight Christmas mass, demonstrators walked silently to the altar, then departed. Mahoney, who hewed the same line as O'Connor, but with less antagonism, elicited less hostility. New York reporters quoted O'Connor's tough, tough talk. Journalists in LA described Mahoney's bridge building. At a 1986 prayer vigil, Mahoney, quote, broke new ground by addressing Catholic homosexuals for the first time as gay Catholics instead of homosexuals. Many in attendance were visibly touched. Quote, Morris Knight, a veteran gay activist, leapt to his feet muttering, this is awesome, simply awesome. In the pew behind him, a man wearing a tan leather jacket rose, weeping silently and applauding. Yet a letter that Mahoney sent to 2,500 nuns and priests over the age of 65 sparked incredulous headlines. The archbishop requested volunteers for an experimental AIDS vaccine. Since the HIV virus was in the serum, there was a chance that volunteers could be infected, spurring a national debate over the ethics of recruiting human subjects for medical trials. Between mid-March and mid-April, the Dallas Morning News ran three stories on Mahoney's letter. Dallas's own bishop, Thomas Chapey, told the paper that the request did not represent a softening in church policy towards homosexuals, but rather an attempt to alleviate suffering. The bishop made clear that compassionate religious responses to AIDS did not mitigate the divine judgment on homosexuality. As the decade progressed, reporters wrote less about religious condemnation of gays, even if, as Bishop Chapey had noted, there was no change in the conservative position. But as AIDS coverage shifted from medical reports on the spread of the illness to feature stories on its human toll, journalists wrote more about coping with AIDS and caring for its victims. Inasmuch as people with AIDS asked, why me? 
and the unaffected wondered, what should I do? Religion suffused many of the stories. By the mid-80s, reporters increasingly explored how religious folks met the pastoral challenges posed by the epidemics. Stories included a nod to the Falwellian perspective, but religious censure, implicitly contrasted with religious caregiving, appeared misguided. Summing up the sentiment, the lead of a 1985 New York Times story reported that religious leaders, quote, called on the public not to stand in judgment of AIDS victims, but to grow in compassion for them. Other stories tracked how different faith groups were responding to the illness. The New York Times reported on a new ha Passover Haggadah for people with AIDS. <coughs> the Dallas Morning News covered Southern Baptist efforts to establish a special ministry. And the LA Times profiled a gay black pastor starting an outreach program for AIDS patients. Even articles that were not about religious outreach frequently cited the work of religious motivated volunteers. Stories stressing the humanity of AIDS patients and their caregivers coincided with the growing number of people who contracted the disease through blood transfusions or heterosexual contact. Still, the is religious issue of homosexuality did not go away in reporting. In the mid to late 1980s, stories about clergy with AIDS became the big news. The morning news reported that the disease had struck rabbis, ministers, and priests. There are more than a dozen cases among the nation's 57,000 Roman Catholic clerics, and, it, and an additional nine had already died. The news was bad enough for Jews and Protestants who believed sexual relations should be confined to heterosexual marriage, but it was especially embarrassing for the Catholic Church, which demanded priestly celibacy. It also was a perfect gotcha story for newspapers that relished exposing religious hypocrisy. Still, it was one thing to report on nameless priests who dying of AIDS were, quote, transferred into relative obscurity. It was another to thing to disclose that a prominent Methodist bishop, a family man and a longtime church bulwark, had died of the disease. Soon after retired Methodist, United Methodist Bishop Finnis Crutchfield passed away on May 20th, 1987, rumors circulated that he had succumbed to AIDS. The family initially denied the story, but on May 24th, the Reverend Charles Cartshield, his son, acknowledged that his father died of AIDS, but he was not homosexual. The subsequent Dallas Morning News story quoted Crutchfield's supposition that he might never know how his father was infected. A follow-up piece reported that the bishop's death humanized AIDS for the church and might nudge it towards accepting homosexuality. End of story for the Dallas Morning News. Several months later, however, the Texas Monthly broke the story of Crutchfield's closeted gay life, belying his son's speculation that the bishop caught the disease by ministering to gay patients. The Dallas Morning News did find local clergy with their own come to Jesus AIDS experience. Two Episcopal priests, the Reverends Chris Steele and Ted Karp, made AIDS central to their ministries after life-changing encounters. Steele was a hospital chaplain when she met a heterosexual businessman who contracted the virus during a blood transfusion. Soon after, she started counseling AIDS patients facing imminent death. It's the finest thing one can do, she told the paper. To give people hope when they go through the shadow of death was tremendously rewarding for me. Karp likewise developed an AIDS ministry by chance. A dying young man appeared at his church door after other congregations refused to help him. Karp couldn't turn him away. Quote, I was scandalized that anyone could tell another human being, no, we are not going to take care of you. But it happened. Religious attitudes were in flux. A 1987 Gallup poll found that Roman Catholic and non-evangelical Christians were among the strongest supporters of the rights of AIDS victims and that 50% of the public, up 8% in four months, disagreed that AIDS was a divine punishment for moral decline. 50% disagreed that it was a divine punishment. But the news media singled out one church group as aloof from the crisis. Despite the rising number of African Americans with AIDS, black congregations offered little comfort and even less outreach to the afflicted, according to press reports. 
In a 1987 New York Times story, city health officials said there are more cases of AIDS among black and Hispanic men than whites, and that intravenous drug users, 90% of whom were black or Hispanic, accounted for over half of the AIDS deaths. Two years later, the paper reported that black clergy, breaking what they say is the silence of many blacks about AIDS, quote, launched a local campaign to mobilize nearly 600 congregations by next fall. Public officials, noting that a disproportionate number of blacks and Hispanics had contracted the disease, said community activism, especially by churches, is long overdue. Black churches had been slow to respond, reporters noted, because most believed that homosexuality was a sin. The combination of public health crisis and religious conflict kept black churches in the news. A 1991 Dallas Morning News piece reported that even though black, gay, and bisexual men were two to three times more likely to contract AIDS than whites, AIDS remained off limits in many black congregations. The story also profiled Reverend Willie C. Champion, who previously preached that God was using AIDS to punish gays and lesbians but was now urging church members to help those with the disease. Several months later, after Magic Johnson's announcement, black churches were again in the news. Black ministers break silence, discuss AIDS, read the LA Times headline. The New York Times story, reluctantly, black churches confront AIDS, was as much about the theological issues at Stymied Outreach as new church activities. The focus on black churches took the spotlight off white ones with similar beliefs. At the time when many moderate white Christians were ready to see AIDS as a spiritual test, could they reach out compassionately to the afflicted, news outlets now cast blacks as bigoted homophobes. Magic Johnson was not a homosexual, a Haitian or a drug user. Neither had he contracted the virus through a blood transfusion. He was a successful athlete whose sexual choices had disastrous consequences. But even before Johnson proved AIDS could affect anyone, the news media profiled individuals unfairly struck by the tragedy. Many of those stories fell into two categories, heterosexual martyrs and gay saints. The, formers were typic the former were typically women who, infected by tainted blood or bisexual male partners when public, hoping to educate others. Saints were gay men whose personal suffering became public performances of love and religious affirmation. Sister Romana Marie Ryan was an early AIDS martyr. A magically gifted kindergarten teacher in San Francisco, she injured her knee on a class trip and was infected by a blood transfusion during surgery. According to her rector, quote, the 66-year-old celibate nun was, quote, the last person anyone would think would get this kind of disease. Yet, according to the newspaper story, even as she faced death, Ryan prayed for the person whose blood she had received and hoped that her passing would spur the search for, the, for a cure. AIDS martyrs usually lived in a paper's catchment area or were types familiar to local readers. The morning news profile of Atlanta native Belinda Mason depicted a white, a quote, white middle-class non-drug using heterosexual housewife from the mountains of Kentucky who received a transfusion of infected blood. Learning she had AIDS, Mason, quote, dedicated her life to helping others understand the pain, fear, and tragedy. Physically devastated, with only months to live, Mason remained steadfast in her commitment to changing public opinion, starting with her very own Southern Baptist Convention. It has, quote, it has been dreadful, the way people have acted and the things people have done in the name of God. It almost makes me ashamed to be a Baptist because I think we can do better than that. In terms of ink spilt, the martyr most covered during the decade was an Indiana teenager, Ryan White. Beginning in 85, White, a hemophiliac who had contracted AIDS from a blood transfusion, waged a protracted legal and political battle to attend public school. After he won, classmates taunted him and his family was physically attacked. The Whites moved to another town and Ryan found acceptance in the last years of his life. 
Aid saints likewise modeled grace and courage. Unlike sufferers who said AIDS was divine punishment, these men felt God's love and yearned to share it. A 1985 LA Times profile of Reverend Steve Peters explained that the 33-year-old gay activist, quote, believes that his sexuality is a gift from God. Peters, who had AIDS, added, quote, I believe God is with me, struggling with his disease. Another cleric with AIDS, a Roman Catholic priest in San Diego, told the paper he could not now go public because of family issues, quote, but when I die, I think it's important that people know about me and know that I died of AIDS, sexually transmitted AIDS. Not all saints were clerics or even religiously committed. In a series of stories about people who tested positive for the HIV virus, the morning news included 23-year-old Charles, a gay intravenous drug user. Since learning about his status, Charles stopped taking drugs and started helping people with AIDS. Although he did not belong to a religious group, Charles saw his work as a spiritual mission. He told the paper that, quote, he was standing in the way of the hand of God until he dedicated himself to helping people with AIDS. At the outside, at the outset of the crisis, mainstream news outlets marginalized AIDS coverage. The straight white men who staffed most newsrooms were uninterested in the gay community and assumed their view reflected the population at large. The only stories that roused them were marked by sensationalism or conflict, gay hedonism and religious condemnation. As a dimension of the AIDS epidemic emerged, these two themes became frames for seeing the disease as a moral as well as medical problem. Even stories that were not about religious responses to AIDS often evoked the moral medical axis. As the gay community responded to the crisis and heterosexual caregivers became involved, real life caught up to religious platitudes and many Christians reconsidered their position. When believers interrogated their faith, Journalists reported their questions. Was God a God of love or judgment? Were biblical injunctions against homosexuality cultural artifacts or eternal truths? At the same time, AIDS spread into the straight community, infecting unsuspecting heterosexual partners, infants, and children, and weakening arguments that blame the epidemic on immorality. Reporters captured the crises of faith experienced by religious folks whose neighbors, friends, and family members were stricken with a disease that initially seemed like a divine scourge. Did reassessing their theological position on AIDS enable some Christians to accept GLBT people as equal members of their congregations, deserving of ordination, and entitled to the sanction of civil and religious marriage? Likewise, did reporting on these believers' struggles predispose news consumers to rethink their own opinions? Or, on the other hand, did hearing Falwell's assertions about gay immorality harden some hearts and convert others? Academics wrestle with the question of whether journalism reflects public opinion or shapes it, if it sets an agenda or circumscribes, circumscribes the discursive field. Insofar as religion influences attitudes about sexuality, which it, does, which it does directly to the faithful and indirectly through cultural osmosis to the rest of us, coverage of religious responses to AIDS offers provocative possibilities for exploring religion in media as well as charting cultural change. In 1981, few Americans would have taken seriously the possibility of gay marriage, including many gays, who might have scuffed at the notion that mirroring what they saw as an inherently heterosexist monogamous lifestyle could be a milestone on their own path to liberation. What caused the change in public consciousness? AIDS for one, including a deepening of gay activism, evolving religious opinion for another, and arguably the news media's role in bringing both to the public's attention. Thank you. So I'd like to invite uh, the campus faculty here, our guests, uh, to first of all reflect and, and give us a
to your opinion about uh, this very fascinating uh, talk. And then afterwards, we'll open it up to Q&A. But uh, for the next uh, few minutes, at least, we, we want to have a focus here. So uh, I'll, I'll hand it to you. Uh, would you like to start, please? <laughs> Put the spotlight on I, I wouldn't have sat here if I thought that that was the beginning. Uh, OK. Um, uh, this is a very wonderful talk, and very rich and fascinating, and raises lots of really important issues. Uh, one uh, thing I would uh, think about is uh, the relationship between uh, in uh, religious affiliations in the USA in the 80s and 90s, and uh, the reaction of churches to AIDS and then media coverage of it. Now, according to, uh, you know, Robert Putnam written this book uh, called American Grace with lots of statistics about shifting patterns of religious affiliation in the USA, he thinks that uh, the rise, especially of kind of conservative, uh, especially evangelical Christianity in the late 70s and 80s was a reaction to um, uh, you know, uh, the shift in, 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 in mores, especially sexual ones, in, from the 60s, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And he interprets uh, the rise as, as basically being caused by, at least in part, by uh, people's uh, unease with what they saw to be too rapid social change and unsettling nature of the 60s cultural movements. And this provoked a kind of a backlash. Uh, but then he sees in the 1990s another kind of shift in which uh, the rise of what he calls the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. So there's an increase in kind of conservative evangelical Christianity in the 80s. And then in the 90, new generation of 90s, uh, a falling off and, and more and more people identify themselves as as having no religion or no affiliation, even though they're searching spiritually, perhaps. And, and how would this fit in with, with this pattern? Um, I, I think maybe one way partially to look at it, especially in the intersection with the media, is the way in which certain kinds of religious entrepreneurs, especially elites, uh, try to uh, make use of the, 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 the AIDS epidemic. Uh, to uh, increase their flocks. And uh, Falwell, I think, was a good, good example of and, and And to use this problem as a kind of a vindication of a certain kind of conservative morality, uh, but to do so in fairly dramatic terms and maybe in, in exaggerated terms, God's punishment and so forth and so on, which uh, could have had the result of, you know, making them celebrities and then uh, increasing the, the number of, of you know, people coming to the congregations. Now what Putnam seemed to think is that what happened in the 90s was that those kinds of, 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 of religious entrepreneurs overplayed their hand and the rise of what he calls Christians in the 80s uh, overdid it and turned people off by politicizing it and, and be, being very, very rigid and so forth, and especially younger of religious groups about uh, homosexuality as, as, as being too rigid and so forth. So uh, this partly tracks this story and intersects with it, I think. Uh, so uh, in, in, in the 80s, this condemnation of of, of AIDS and of homosexuality and AIDS as a God's punishment for it. And then in the 90s, there's been a, a shift. Now, whether this shift is connected with the media directly or media re reflects it, is, it's, it's complicated, I'm not so sure. But uh, part of the shift is a result of people being turned off by the excessive rhetoric of, of people in the, in, in the 80s, these leaders. And I, I might uh, also suggest making a distinction between kind of religious elites, uh, you know, leaders like Falwell and Pat Robertson, and for that matter, bishops, uh, cardinals like Cardinal O'Connor, et cetera, and ordinary kind of lay people. 
Uh, and I think in many of these cases, what happens is the elites, the celebrities, think that they, you know, they, they want to expand their flocks and their influence, and they have to kind of uh, uh, express their beliefs in fairly dramatic terms, uh, often black and white, stereotypical. Whereas ordinary people have to deal with complexity to life and have a more complicated, uh, nuanced understanding. And, and therefore, people with that more complex understanding and caught up with these elites who the, the lay people saw as being out of touch and too rigid and so forth. So uh, I would maybe, my initial reflection is to you know, tell the story, at least part of those terms, with the media uh, affecting it. And one, one thing you point out very interesting is how certain turning points come, in fact, through um, the actions of certain kinds of celebrities, so Magic Johnson uh, getting the disease. So, uh, I, I, and I, other things I've done also suggest the ch changes in consciousness come, there's a gradual shift, but then they're kind of dramatic little quantum leaps which also come from kind of spectacular events which are also triggered by things that, that celebrities do. And you get different kinds of celebrities. You get people like Magic Johnson, et cetera. You get religious celebrities like, like Pat Robertson and so forth. And so you get partly kind of a dialectic of, of celebrities in this, which then, of course, capture the attention of the media in various kinds of ways. So uh, my, my initial my thoughts building upon what, what you said is in, in as much take of how it's an American uh, public life have, have kind of intersected with the, the development of this, uh, of, of the AIDS epidemic, AIDS crisis, and so forth. Uh, thank you for, for your talk. Um, it's been provocative for me uh, to think about the prompt that you left off with um, having to do with whether or not reporting predisposed readers to kind of reimagine their relationship to homosexuality and gay and lesbian politics in the public sphere, helping us to arrive at a moment where gay marriage becomes, you know, reported alongside, you know, uh, bombs over Baghdad, for example. Um, and for me, I think, um, the, the narrative that you offer helps me to, to kind of reimagine that genealogy a little bit in thinking about how perhaps the, um, you know, the legacy of overcoming AIDS that is kind of laid claim to by certain gays in particular, um, I think has, has, has left a sense of a kind of, so for example, um, ACT UP led to a significant amount of research that was um, resulting in clinical trials that specifically targeted white gay men as recipients of drug cocktails that enabled a, a particular demographic to receive treatment and that, I think, has possibly contributed to a kind of narrative of, um, of, of uh, almost like a cure. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when we look at AIDS in 2013, AID, the geography of AIDS has shifted so significantly that it is no longer even imagined to exist in the US. Um, it was only until, uh, I think about two or three months ago when there was reporting about a newborn that was born in Mississippi who had received an anti-serum that uh, enabled the newborn to be declared um, cured <laughs> in, in, in all, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, so I wonder um, if the reporting possibly resulted in contributing to a kind of sense of an exceptionalism that was attached to particular gay bodies mm -hmm. in their capacity to overcome that which was imagined to be, you know, 
that which would have decimated them as a population. And I wonder um, how, how that may have led us to a moment of gay marriage, uh, which is also a phenomenon that is primarily represented by similar kinds of bodies, you know? Um, and so I wonder, so, so your, your focus on evangelic, evangelicalism um, has also kind of inspired me to think a little bit about to what degree has, evan has that particular Christianity been enabled to thrive because of AIDS? So when we look at Africa and the kind of spread of evangelical Christianity in Africa, it almost corresponds with the spread of AIDS in Africa, mm -hmm. such that evangelical Christianity is such an, a kind of proliferating religious form in Africa at a moment when AIDS is almost exclusively contained in Africa and Brazil. So, um, so I guess what I would love to hear you think, talk about if, if you know, this is something that interests you is to what degree we might see a kind of corresponding relationship between evangelical Christianity and the spread of AIDS, especially when we look beyond the US context and into sites where AIDS continues to proliferate and where drugs have, for, most, for, for the most part, not proliferated. Um, like the other panelists, thank you, Diane, for um, your talk. Um, and uh, it brought me back uh, in very uh, powerful ways to the period of the late 1980s when, uh, as a young college student as, and as a member of ACT UP, I was um, very much shaped by religious discourse, however, in a very different way. Um, not the mainstream discussions of uh, immorality or the sort of innocent slash savior uh, narratives that you provided, but in fact two very iconic uh, religious images that um, were very powerful for uh, my colleagues and me. Uh, one of them was a piece of graphic art that was designed by the uh, ACT UP related uh, art collective called Grand Fury, and it was a picture uh, usually done on something like lime green, very bright day glow colors, and it had a line down the middle on one side had a picture of Cardinal O'Connor, and on the other side, a picture of a condom. And it said, know your scumbags. <laughs> the other one was an advertisement slash uh, commissioned artwork that uh, was done by, of all organizations, the Benetton Clothing Corporation, and appeared in um, newsprint, it appeared in magazines, it appeared on billboards until it was banned uh, or at least it caused controversy in many countries, and it was a picture of a uh, young man um, at the, in the very last stages of AIDS um, who was accompanied by what looked like a crying mother and father, and it was very much done as a pieta scene, mm -hmm. very uh, using the iconography of religious um, you know, painting and, 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 or religious sculpture to kind of construct a scene in which there was a relationship that was being drawn between um, this person uh, dying of AIDS. Uh, and in fact, I think that the, the article, uh, excuse me, the, the photograph might have been called Dying on AIDS or Dying of AIDS. And uh, a, a very important uh, you know, symbol of, of religious iconography like the Pieta. The reason I bring those in, up is that both of them, I think, demonstrate um, a strain of media representation that emerged exactly the same moment that you're trying to historicize. And that's the emergence of alternative media forms, which in certain ways uh, not just compete with, but also contradict the kind of mainstream. I mean, I think you did a very good job of drawing our attention to the contrast between the New York Times uh, rep rep reporting or lack thereof during um, the early years of the AIDS crisis and uh, a more regional paper like the Dallas Morning News, which um, was not on people, a lot of people's radar, but in fact was doing sort of extraordinary journalistic work during that time. But of course, this was also a period of this kind of efflorescence of alternative media forms, um, from underground zines to um, local access cable channels that were proliferating in cities like San Francisco, New York, and Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, 
all of which were trying to provide a kind of alternate uh, uh, way of reporting on, accounting for, and providing kind of cultural forums for people who were either um, dealing with, um, uh, with AIDS, or AIDS slash HIV, or other um, uh, sort of related issues, uh, whole discussions about the role of uh, bathhouses, for example, in distributing condoms and public health information. Sort of, so these uh, institutions that were identified as these kind of you know, vectors of, of, of immorality or disease, like a bathhouse or a, or a disco or something like that, were actually by a whole other group of people being seen as community institutions that provided information and education and outreach and so forth. So I guess my, my, my general response is to kind of think about kind of another kind of parallel version of the 1980s that's happening exactly the same time that these mainstream institutions like the New York Times and others are trying to kind of characterize what's going on. And I know that that kind of large sweep of the media landscape is not necessarily your, um, you know, your, your media here, but I think it's worth thinking about because for every uh, lack of, of uh, you know, New York Times or every omission by the New York Times or every mischaracterization by the New York Times, there's you know, uh, dozens of other regional, local, alternative, subcultural representations that are happening at the same time. Um, and you know, last but not least, I would say that one of the co uh, coincidental things that emerges in the, late, the mid to late 80s and early 90s that is exactly following the same trajectory is that in academic circles, at any rate, there's this emergence of what now people call queer theory, which is breaking down the homo-hetero binary so that when you encounter populations of, of men in the 1980s and 90s um, who have sex with other men, it's no longer useful to talk about them as are they gay or are they straight. In fact, you know, um, um, medical statisticians and public health officials, they coined a new phrase, men who have sex with men. Are they straight or are they gay? In fact, it's perfect immaterial to the fact that there's lots of sexual activity going on that is um, responsible for spreading the HIV virus. So there's a, there's a kind of breakdown of mainstream paradigms that I think are centralized around uh, media, that are centralized around thinking about identity categories. This is, after all, the heyday of identity politics in the 1980s, which leads to Pat Robertson declaring the culture war at the Republican National Convention in 1992. So there's sort of this, these alternative 80s strains that are happening exactly at the same time that the story that you're telling is, and I think that they're worth kind of thinking about as you expand the scope of your project. Um, thank you for this most helpful, these most helpful suggestions and um, interpretations. Um, I'm, I have been interested in the way many American news consumers treat the main, have treated the mainstream newspaper as transparent at best and liberal at worst. And I think people, when they think about everything from CBS News to the New York Times to the LA Times, they think that you know, you're getting the news that's fit to print, you're getting it without a lot of bias, and you're getting it, um, you're getting just the facts. And one of the things I've tried to do in this project is to show how racist, heterosexist, and class assumptions are shot through every news decision that people make, and that emotional narratives you know, do the heavy lifting of social constructions that tend to bias the way we look at some very basic things, such as our, our sexuality, and our relationship to the community. So what you point out is extremely helpful, and it is a good idea. It wasn't what I was doing, <laughs> but it's a good idea. Um, I also think that the issue of, of um, class and race, although I only allude to it here, is very much a story of AIDS. And I was particularly interested in the way you know, the Times began to single out the black churches as the culprits or the, the people who weren't paying attention to this crisis. 
at a time when there were still many white homophobes and white churches that were still ranting about the AIDS crisis. And the way it was easy for them to wag fingers, this community isn't doing anything, like there aren't a host of problems that are being dealt with, with by these communities. And I think your insight about what's happening in Africa is very exciting and would be a terrific project. Um, and yes, as far as looking at this in terms of the larger project of shifts in American religion, what's so striking to me is how the numbers have changed. I mean, if you look at the percentages of Americans in the early, in the late 70s and early 80s who were, you know, uncomfortable with homosexuality, and you think about where we are now, it's tremendous. And if you look at the younger population that are the nuns, you know, this is one of their main issues and one of the main reasons why they say they've turned away from churches. So uh, overall, I mean, I think looking at the AIDS crisis provides us with an opportunity to think about race, class, change, religion, media, it, through these new lens that kind of go above and beyond ways we th normally think about it as sort of, you know, oh, that happened in the 1980s and now it's over and we don't have to remember it anymore. I mean, it's still reverberating today, which is what interests me so much. If I can just jump in, one thing that might be worth drawing attention to in terms of the history of a newspaper like the Dallas Morning Herald, which I know you know quite well, is in terms of its relationship to church reporting, you know, here's a newspaper that was doing quite uh, kind of uh, radical reporting in the 1980s, but the Dallas Morning Herald in the United States is also well known for being one of the um, uh, most important papers in terms of uh, publicizing and reporting on scandals of pedophilia uh, among um, priests and has done a tremendous amount of uh, uh, of work of, of sort of looking at the you know relocation of priests from parishes in the United States and also abroad so has done so so its relationship to uh, relig religious history or religious culture uh, from the AIDS crisis of the, of, of the early to mid 1980s through its most recent reportage on uh, sort of the, the crisis of the church of, of a different kind um, into the early 21st century is, is quite a remarkable shift. So that newspaper's coverage has um, really been responsible for uh, enormously complex ways of thinking about um, church and state um, in the United, and health in the United States. Now let's open up uh, the forum. Uh, I'm just going to give this to this one with you. Thanks. Uh, one comment about Magic Johnson. I, I may be naive, and well, maybe I'm the only person who thought he was breaking the binaries. So I never saw the report of his uh, AIDS diagnosis as a watershed in the way that you were suggesting. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the relationship between the media and uh, the religious. I mean, one of the interesting things about Pat Robinson is that he is a sort of steady state uh, channeler of uh, God's wrath. I mean, he attributed uh, the World Trade Center attack as God's wrath, and most recently, Hurricane Katrina as an indication of God's wrath, and yet the media doesn't pay such attention to him anymore. So in a wider context, I wondered if you could comment on the rise and fall of media attention to people in that role. And along the way, I wondered if it had anything to do with a, a, a change in electronic media at the time of the rise of um, people like Robertson and Falwell, when in um, particularly late night, um, like ABC shows, tended to structure oppositional debate, which seemed to me new at the time, which, which gave a forum and a need for them to feed that, that, that then infected the Print, the way the print media reported it. Thank you. In the mainstream media in the 80s, um, because of several factors, including the success of USA Today and the birth of CNN, um, news media became a lot more interested in, in sensationalism and conflict. I mean, those strains have been present there since the beginning of American news media, but it became more so as 
newspapers also began being parts of large conglomerates and the bottom line became more important. And I think it was just kind of the perfect confluence of these media, these religious media presence who knew how to speak to reporters and who could say outrageous things and reporters who wanted good quotes that could set up a story and set up the culture war antagonism. Um, what surprises me at all is that we still see Robertson in the newspaper. Um, the fact that they are asking him about Katrina baffles me when what he's saying and the constituency he represents seems to be so <sighs> tangential to the mainstream of American politics right now. It's not as if there are not conservative religious figures. It's just that he does not seem to represent them. Um, I think that the news media still does quote those kind of polarized figures. They're just not I, they're just not doing it with Falwell and Wolf well, Falwell's dead, but they're just not doing it with people like Robertson anymore. I don't think that setting up those sort of extreme positions is something that stopped happening. I just think new people are in the mix. Uh, Professor Winston, uh, in, in reflecting uh, on uh, your revealing comments about the media and it's virtually ignoring uh, these issues that you discussed. It was very helpful. Um, and then Professor Madison mentioned the nuns in the 90s. I was wondering, in thinking about your own program, the night program, why is it that you completely ignore anti-theism in that program? Uh, since I think the Pew Center says that that's a growing number, the nuns of the 90s are now 20% of the American population. Uh, are you making a mistake? Are you making the same mistake that the uh, uh, big time newspapers made in the 80s? Um, well, we, we are, I don't have a center. So I'm not, a, my center isn't ignoring anything. And in fact, um, that's one of, I mean, I'm teaching a course on that. So um, I. Well, one reads your website. Well, my, my website has been um, on hiatus for almost a year now. So I, I have a very, very slow moving web designer. <laughs> so, but, but actually my focus on the website when I put it back together again is gonna be on religion um, in, an, in an international context. So it may not have as much about nuns as you might hope because internationally that's not what my programmatic focus is. I personally am engaged with trying to raise money to do some projects on that. So if you know any rich people who want to give me some money, I would put much more time and energy into it. I mean, I think I'm not alone in thinking this, but you know, studying secularisms and, and nuns and it, it's sort of the way the field is moving right now. And I think we need people to really pay attention to it. It's just a matter of, getting the time and the support to do it. So from your mouth to Ford's ears. Thank you. Well, that was very interesting. And I'm wondering if you feel comfortable speculating on how the gay community, especially the male gay community, has actually changed, maybe in conjunction with the journalistic reportage. So you see this shift from at least what looks like from the outside, a, a more of a hedonistic approach to, you know, now we're getting married and, you know, as it were, settling down. And I'm wondering if you think that um, that, that shift is um, an appearance that we see just from how, how journalists are reporting on gay marriage or whether you think that the AIDS crisis had a kind of internal dialectic inside the gay community that did have to do with issues of pleasure and, and intimacy and, um, and numbers of partners. I mean, in, in your wonderful talk, it was kind of a binary between innocent people who were suffering from an illness and how they were um, being mistreated by the media. And I don't, I don't doubt the authenticity of that, but I wondered if, if you were shifting your focus to the history of the gay community 
whether any of the issues that were in the very blaming religious-oriented press reportage, you know, had, had a meaning. Maybe not that meaning, but some kind of meaning. Well, I, I am many things, but one thing I'm not is a historian or a sociologist of the gay community. I mean, I am interested in media and religion, and I'm interested, and I mean, it's interesting to me, one thing that you said especially, is does the media represent any kind of reality or is it all just made up? And you know, when the media, the media only does stories on things that, it's going to, that it thinks is interesting or it thinks other people is gonna think are interesting. So when it's writing about gay libertinism in the 1970s, you know, does that represent 95% of the population or 5% of the population? You know, Someone, I suppose one could find it out. What's interesting to me, though, is that the media chose to tell that story and how it told the story. So whether it's real is another dimension from the fact that this is a medi mediated story. So I don't know, I mean, as someone who is in communication, and who thinks about these issues, I'd be curious to what you think about that because I guess that's what I was saying before about transparency. We tend to think that what the media tells us is the story, but it's, is it ever the story? And whose story is it? And what does it have to do with reality? And I find those questions very fascinating. Well, I would just add to the, one of the things that's probably one of the most uh, sort of dispiriting things that I've heard in the past uh, few years is among, when I speak to my younger, when my, my students or people, let's say, who are a generation younger than me, uh, who say to me some version of all the men, and these are usually young men, um, lots of different ethnic backgrounds, uh, all the men who either contracted uh, HIV uh, uh, are still around or, and, it, and it's because of miracles of modern medicine, or those who had AIDS are all dead. So the slate is now clean, and I can do what I want, and I don't really have to think about safe sex, because if I contract HIV, there's a magic pill. So it's almost as if 30 years of HIV education slash AIDS activism has, if not been forgotten, then at least it's been sort of um, kind of folded into uh, new ways of thinking about um, uh, being in a world where there's some medicine that can just take care of that, and so some version of hedonism, if you want to use that word, um, sort of has returned among certain gay men, um, whereas there's others who have now been extremely seduced by the thrills of domesticity and same-sex marriage and monogamy and, and so forth. So there's, you know, I'm making grand generalizations but I think that you can kind of see both of those narrative coexisting at the same time. Um, I don't really have to think about it because all those people are dead and I can just really have a good time and I don't even identify as gay so it doesn't even matter. You know, I'll just go off and be on the DL as they say. Um, or um, I will um, get, you know, I marry my husband and we'll, you know, go live in happy domesticity in Garden Grove or whatever. So I think that those two things are happening at the same time and to what degree they've been shaped by or influenced by or in some kind of dialogue with um, the kind of history that Diana has, has, has um, uh, presented, I think it's very interesting. And I mean, it, Roshi's comment about the way in which the popular imagination has now relocated the AIDS crisis to other parts of the world, of course, ignores the fact that there's still the AIDS crisis happening in the United States. Um, but the fantasy is that we now know how to take care of it. It's, uh, having HIV is now a manageable chronic illness in the way that sort of having asthma is chronic illness, which of course is gross generalization too, but I think that's part of the shift that's happened over the past 30 years, and now it's relocated in other parts of the world where the things are, are dire, while they're still very dire here. So I think that's one of the legacies that's happened over the past 30 but, years. But I also think that part of the media Part of the story I want to tell is the media does tell binary stories. That's the media's favorite way to tell a story. There are innocents and there are perpetrators and there are victims and there are martyrs. I mean, those are the kind of narratives we get. And we also, 
you know, valorize some people above other people, and we think that things are okay now when they were wrong before. I mean, and yet the media still plays an important role in helping us think about the world we live in and relate to other people and address social issues. So penetrating those media narratives and trying to figure out what story's being told, how's it being told, who's being represented in which way, and who's being left out, I think helps us to think about the normalization we do in the course of a day when we think, oh, that person hates America and this person likes America. I mean, I, I just think the media has to be radically deconstructed in that way if we're ever going to understand who we are and what we're doing. Now, obviously, today, it's much easier to do that because we have so many alternative forms of news media and we don't have to rely on the mainstream media. But back in the 80s, you know, yes, there was a growing world of alternative, alternatives, but still, there was a, it was a hegemon, greatly hegemonic force back then. Mm -hmm. Professor Winston, I just want to thank you so much for this talk. It was, it was absolutely fascinating. And I want to thank all the members of the panel, too. And actually, it was a combination of Professor Winston's and Rojnak. OK, I got that. Okay. Uh, your comment that brings up the question that I have here. Uh, this whole concept of uh, HIV bodies is something that I wanted to get into, and in particular, your interest in the relationship between media and religion. And Rojnak's comment where the geography of AIDS is now it's really in Africa. And comparing the idea of African bodies with AIDS compared to uh, homosexual bodies with AIDS in the 1980s, where there does seem to be the idea where American media, to a great extent, just ignores those bodies. It doesn't have any sort of quality. Where in the early 1980s, there is a moral quality put on those bodies when they are identified. And I want to know, in your project, how much do you plan to talk about, in a way, whether it's intentionally uh, collusive relationship between, which is my conspiratorial mind working, but a collusive relationship working between the media and evangelicals, because those bodies are basically given to the evangelicals to create this idea of what can be something that is amoral, that is the idea of the end. The, there's a very apocalyptic sense in the 1980s that happens in the evangelical and the right. And there is, a, there is a rise of the right, which you talk about in your talk. And there does seem to be, we've seen the comments in the panelists, how the idea of using that body to rise evangelical power. And part two of my question, if you'll forgive me, is uh, in terms of the media then, not just in terms of those who are actually within the newspaper proper, the editors, the writers, but I'm curious, are you also going to get into the owners of those newspapers and how they might be involved in decisions that are made? Since we talk so much today about how owners of newspapers are involved in decisions that happen with newspapers, and their, their political decisions and their, their social ideals seem to be impacting newspapers so much today. And I'm, I, I have no idea how that exists in the 80s, but I'm very curious to know if there's any way to discover that. Well, this is actually part of a larger project about the media's role in facilitating the Reagan revolution. That's what I was going to ask. Is Reagan any part of this <laughs> at all? <laughs> yeah. First time this, the name has been mentioned, and, yeah. which is a parallel with the fact that Reagan didn't mention the word AIDS until 1987. So I think there's some transhistorical thing happening right now. Uh, so I'm I'm very interested in what was happening into the in the media world in the 80s, and as I said, you know, it was a time of um, these great changes that were wrought by USA Today and by CNN, but also a time when large uh, multinationals like Cap Cities and GE began buying up a lot of media properties. And so they kind of went from this noblesse oblige of you know, family owners to larger corporations who were more bottom line oriented. So I mean, that's part of the story as well. Um, and I don't know if these people were in collusion. I don't think they, some of them may have been in collusion with evangelicals, I don't know. But I think they shared a concern with the neoliberal worldview that 
help them all see the same kind of story. I mean, they all kind of track together at that time. So the whole contention that the media was liberal, and which was something that was repeated and repeated from Nixon onwards, is something I'm hoping to refute in this work. OK, any more questions? There's one more after that we probably have to end. Well, thank, thanks so much for this talk. Um, I'm kind of thinking about um, coming from the perspective of, of literature and um, thinking about the role that art may have had to play in the conversation. In some ways, you, you see, particularly based on what, what you've presented, you see um, a lot of um, kind of right-leaning media around um, the AIDS epidemic, especially in the 1980s. And then you see this backlash in the world of art. Uh, the Day Without Art, the musical Rent, you see all of these films, you see all of these movie stars that are kind of coming out on the other side. So that there's also almost kind of a juxtaposition between art and, art and news media. And I'm wondering how you see that figuring into this whole conversation. How do you see art, literature, film as, is that part of media? Um, because it's certainly picked up by the media. Or right. is there almost kind of a refutation of it? Um, I've been thinking about this week, that exact thing this week, not in terms of the AIDS crisis, but I've been writing about the new patriotism of the 80s and how that meme was sort of begun in newspapers and, and then you saw it come to life in a very variety of TV shows and movies in the mid 80s. Um, and so I was thinking about how do these things feed off of each other and, and um, I, I still think though, and maybe this is my bias and someone from your, your camp could refute me, I still think that, at least in that period, the media sort of laid down a template for how we would think about things. And then it might have gotten picked up and generated. And, be, and even if you opposed it, it was still basically you know, the, the discursive field that the media had set down, that the news media had set down. And I think part of that is due to the fact that the news media was seen as real, whereas the art world was seen as made up. And so the real precedes the, make, the made up in a certain, in a way. Um, now, did it resonate back? I, I think it would be hard for reporters to see, or even publishers, to see themselves as being subject to the nonfiction world. I mean, it's one thing to report on it. It's another thing to think you're inspired by it or you're moved by it. I mean, it would be interesting to try to plumb that. I don't know. What do you think? No, it would be interesting. I see it as an interesting um, example of perhaps a, um, a space where we're hard to see themselves about. Oh, sorry. Well, I won't repeat that because I spoke loud enough, right? But, no, I, I just see it as an interesting case study, actually, that you're bringing up for art versus media. Right. And, it's, of course, it's interesting because even in the 80s, you know, there were a lot of newspaper people who went to Hollywood because I think they felt that their reporting wasn't getting the stories out. I'm thinking, you know, Kurt Ludke and um, who's the guy who did China Beach? A couple of different people. I mean, so obvious. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of interactions, but I mean, when I think about what are the essential qualities of each, I have to think that um, newspaper in took itself more, much more seriously and its boundaries were higher. I, I would just say that I think the, the interface to get at your question is someone like Frank Rich, mm -hmm. um, who was art critic. Uh, and um, theater critic for the New York Times, and so kind of moved, I mean, and then ultimately became, you know, columnist uh, for the Times. So he kind of is this interface figure between the sort of hierarchical world of the Times, the great lady of 43rd Street and all that, and then the art world, uh, which each, and you know, he's a champion of uh, plays like Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart, which is a very early AIDS play and so forth. Okay. He didn't um, go to Hollywood, though. He didn't go to Hollywood, that's right. He did. 
Well, I know what the, uh, the topic for the next forum will be. Domesticity in Garden Grove. <laughs> so, and, and uh, is it because Garden Grove is boring? Are you suggesting that? I'm just kidding. No, but uh, it's, it's a great place to visit. But anyway, uh, I want to thank uh, our guest here, especially Professor Dan Winston, for being here and, and having a wonderful discussion about this topic. Please, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you very much.